thank you very much to allow us to have you in front to talk about quantum technologies. So I would like to start. So bringing some reflections about quantum. Yes, uh, about quantum technologies. So first of all, I would like to uh, address some words about the international system of units. So the new international system of units, units is based on uh, fundamental constants. The Planck constant, the Boltzmann constant, the electric charge of the electron, and, and, and so on. There, but the realization of the definitions of the new uh, uh, the, the realization of the new definitions of the units needs quantum technologies. For example, let's think in the ampere. To reproduce the ampere, we need to count electron by electron with some fixed frequency. So that is, in that you need clocks to count electrons, you need to uh, gates to get electrons by, by, by one, so that's one thing only from my point of view. Uh, of course, the, the, units of, the unit of time, the second, makes also quantum technologies because clocks are artifacts using quantum physics and so on. So I, I just want to invite our guest, international guest, to bring us a few words about why, what you think quantum technologies are and why we need them. So, yeah, I, I think it's kind of be uh, free to say reflections about this. So, let, so, please. So let me start with, okay? So this is an office dialogue, okay? They are not here with the office. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think uh, we need to put a little bit of an adjective when we talk about quantum technologies now. I think we have to talk about quantum technologies of the second quantum revolution. Uh, yes, I will. Uh, so, uh, the discovery of quantum mechanics enabled the first quantum revolution, and I would say that uh, our lives changed in an incredible way when that happened, because that gave us the transistor. That's quantum. That gave us the knowledge of the energy levels, that's quantum. And that's what I would call the first quantum revolution. That gave us the laser, and the laser is also a first quantum revolution. And here, what we are trying to find out here I believe, is what does the second quantum revolution bring us. And I would say, and Bill will immediately jump, but that's okay, uh, is that uh, it is uh, the moment, to me, uh, when the discussion about entanglement went from okay, the entanglement is a characteristic of quantum mechanics to say entanglement is a resource. Entanglement is something that we can use. And for me, it's really the work of John Bell that says, hey, we can put a bound in 1964. We can go to the lab and measure it. And from then on, the second quantum revolution started. Uh, the real... Uh, let's call it inference of money, came in the 90s, right? Uh, but uh, uh, the real use of superposition and the real use of uh, uh, entanglement are what defines the, what we are, what I think, and please discuss, is the second quantum revolution and that's where we're going to say these are the quantum technologies. So you have to be using, you have to be harnessing entanglement. And we know that everything is entangled, but not all the entanglement is equal. 
And not all the, not all the entanglement is useful. And it's our job to tame that. But anyway, so now. Okay, I'll just use this one. So, in fact, I, I agree with everything that, that Louise said. Let me just amplify it a little bit. That doesn't happen. <laughs> um, What has made the second quantum revolution something of importance? Yes, I, I would agree that it, it starts with, with John Bell, because before John Bell, people may have known there was such a thing as entanglement, but they didn't realize how weird it was. And they didn't think it was something they had to think about. And I think John Bell forced people to think about entanglement. And, and then the next thing that happened was people started to think about what they could use entanglement for. And we had things like squeezing. Uh, and I think squeezing is part of the second quantum revolution. And we're getting better and better at doing those kinds of things. And then along comes quantum computing and Shor's algorithm and the idea that you could do something fundamentally different. The idea that you could change the complexity class of a computational problem by changing the hardware on which you did it. Now, I don't think anybody's actually proved that that's the case because nobody's proved that uh, factoring doesn't have a polynomial algorithm, but nobody believes it does. So, <laughs> so, so that means that Shor's algorithm effectively changed the complexity class of a computational problem by changing the hardware, and that's that's revolutionary. Uh, and we began to have the tools that allowed us to have solid state systems that could be coherent for long enough that you could do something interesting with them. Atomic physicists had been uh, using uh, coherence for a long time, but uh, an awful lot of the, the things that happened technologically happened in condensed matter systems. And having those systems be coherent for long periods of time uh, has been something that the latter part of the 20th century brought us, and now in the beginning of the 21st century we're seeing uh, the ability to do that better and better. Uh, there's a kind of a, a Moore's law for the coherence of superconducting qubits that has turned superconducting qubits from a, a curiosity into something that looks like a real possible platform for quantum computation. So these are the things that are really different. Now, when we go asking for money, we have a very different attitude about what we consider to be quantum. And basically quantum is anything that we're doing now in the lab. Uh, and and we, we ask uh, people to give us money for that because of the usual reasons. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, why is it important? So I might answer that question in two different ways. One of the reasons is that there are things that we couldn't do before uh, the second quantum revolution that we can do now. And the other point is, which is much broader and involves both the first and second quantum revolution is, the world is quantum. And if we want to, uh, to make use of all of the, the opportunities that this amazing world we live in gives us, then we better understand the quantum features of it. And even if it's part of the first quantum revolution, we may be able to do a much better job of, uh, uh, of doing things in that first quantum revolution. Think about optical clocks. That's all first quantum revolution. But my heavens, isn't it amazing? So I'm going to pass the, the microphone over to Eckhart. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, my, my ideas uh, about, about quantum, quantum technologies, uh, I think what, what we are encountering at, at present or over the last 10, 10, 20 years or so is really a, a transition from, uh, from research, from what used to be quite fundamental, uh, knowledge-driven, curiosity-driven research towards, uh, towards applications. So if, if I look at uh, how I came into the field of trapping and cooling or so, there was some, some very simplistic feature that, that attracted me that was to do experiments on, the, on a single atom level. So I thought that was really something that, that, was, that was different from ordinary matter. One would isolate a single atom and look at, and look at its dynamics and, and behavior. And, and people made experiments like looking for quantum jumps or so. And, uh, and at the time, it was, it was experiments that were relatively 
difficult or so, signals were small, uh, signals were weak looking at that light from a single atom. Um, and people really did not think very much about uh, applications or in the sense it was really getting these things going and understanding what, uh, what one would, would be seeing. And now over the years we, we are really seeing that, uh, that, that there is applications of these, uh, of these devices like for example for, for precise clocks or for, for quantum information processing. And we are also seeing uh, uh, really a change of the experiment that, that from being really something very heroic that, uh, that used has to be tweaked by, by, by a number of students uh, in the lab, uh, things are becoming robust. Uh, and I think that's also and that's useful uh, uh, for, for long-term operation. I think that's also something where it's very important uh, that, uh, that what is really what can be isolated as quantum goes together with technology development in electronics. We saw very nice pictures this morning in, in Scott's talk about uh, about uh, chips that produce electric waveforms with very with a very good control and, uh, and, and combining these features with uh, with uh, the uh, with the behavior and measurements on single atoms and that is something I think that that is really uh, has expanded the technological. Um, uh, capabilities uh, that, uh, that people can do in experiments and, uh, and I think it's, yeah, it's now we are really seeing that it is, it is opening uh, to, to, to applications. Um, yeah, I, I, I see it very much as a, as a, a little bit as a, as a gradual, maybe more as a gradual development than, than as a revolution, but I think the applications will really be uh, are already there and that uh, there will be dramatic applications uh, uh, appearing, and I think that's that's what something that's going to to keep the field interesting uh, from different perspectives. May I pass? Uh, hello. Yeah, I I would take up uh, what Mauricio started with talking about the SI units. In today's uh, very great talk, Dr. Phillips has talked about defining the base units all in terms of fundamental quantities, constants of nature, except the time. It's based on atom-specific definition, but I, I, I think that is inevitable because I, uh, basically, you know, if you see uh, uh, fundamentally what is a clock, a clock is, uh, at the heart of a clock is a periodic phenomenon a wave or what have you, and then something that counts the number of cycles of that clock and something that displays what time it is. So that's a clock. But the counting and displaying are fairly mundane matters. They don't make errors. So basically the goodness of the clock is the periodic oscillation. So the periodic oscillation uh, in terms of macroscopic phenomena such as a pendulum, or the earth rotating about its axis, or uh, quartz oscillations, etc., all are not good enough. But what, what we now define in terms uh, a quantum definition of a periodic oscillation is an electron jumping from one level to another level in its orbit, and hence producing a frequency, which is e2 minus e1 equals a constant times a photon frequency, which is very fundamental. So if you can build a clock out of that source of frequency, that would be the best definition, the best clock that you could ever build, provided you could have, you know, an ideal situation. For instance, you could have just one atom sitting there in vacuum with a perfect ambience, uh, no electric magnetic fields around, no neighboring atoms around, and this guy not moving, so no Doppler shift. So, perfectly ideal conditions, which are very hard to simulate in actual practice. So, but if we could do that, that would be the fundamental clock definition, fundamental definition of time that we could ever have. I, I, I don't think it really needs a fundamental constant beyond the two energy levels of an atom, right? So, uh, but anyway, uh, as we go from, you know, one atom species or one kind of transition to another kind of atom species and another 
transition perhaps in the optical domain or perhaps in, in the future, in Eckhart's case, the nuclear transitions with even greater energy levels and higher frequencies will probably move into uh, more and more accurate definitions of the uh, unit of time. But however, fundamentally, I think even with whatever transition you take, if you could experimentally achieve those ideal conditions that I talked about, I think you'd have a pretty decent definition of the unit of time. So, but anyway, uh, it's, it's still, time is still the most interesting and perhaps the most accurately realizable uh, unit that has ever happened to us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I started out my talk today saying that quantum is a word that we need to define. And I really like the, the two definitions or the definitions that were given here. Um, you know, maybe the first quantum revolution and the second, sometimes we like to call it quantum 1.0 and quantum 2.0. All right, I, I think it's a nice insight that maybe quantum 2.0 began with John Bell. Um, that being said, I'm, I'm kind of a semi-classical guy. That's where I've lived most of my life. So I have a hard time giving you great insight into quantum 2.0. There's still a lot of fun in room in quantum 1.0, I would say. And in fact, there's, um, you know, if, if I can use the example of clocks, you know, a, a, making a clock is, is a lot about other types of measurement problems, which is how well can you generate a signal and how low can you make the noise. If you want to count these ticks, in fact, you're, you're always subdividing ticks at terms. We don't actually just count tick by tick. We count a tick. We count a thousand of a tick, <laughs> if you can believe that. So, so that comes down to this question of signal to noise. And for about, I mean, certainly for as long as I've been in the business, it's, it's much easier to turn up the signal than it is to turn down the noise. OK, so we, we always try to turn down the noise. But it's been easier to buy a bigger laser, it's been easier to build a better detector than it is to squash the noise with quantum mechanics, for example, by squeezing or correlating the noise in some way so that it can be reduced. In clocks, this often shows up in the time it takes to do the measurement. For example, if you want to have a clock with a single ion, then quantum mechanics tells you what the, the, the fundamental limit of the noise in that clock is. This is called the quantum projection noise. It was Dave Wineland, I think, and colleagues who first wrote that down for at least ions. And if you want to improve that, you could take two ions and entangle them in some way, entangle their spins, for example. And then you could win by square root of two. But what often happens when you go to do that is you find out it takes you twice as long to prepare the ions in this entangled state. So while you were preparing them, you lost precision, so to speak. So this is, this is a real hard problem. That's not to say we shouldn't keep trying, because there will come a day when we will have exhausted all of our quantum 1.0 tricks, all of our classical tricks, and we will still want more. And then I think we will really rely on the, the, the quantum 2.0. And we shouldn't wait until that moment comes to learn how to do it. It's, now is the right time to learn. They're, they're just related to this, there is a very interesting story. Some of you might know Carl Caves, the name Carlton Caves. He is a, more in the field of quantum optics, but is really one of the founders of the field of quantum metrology wrote some very seminal papers kind of in the context of interferometers. How would you measure length or a length change very precisely and at a quantum limit, and how could you go beyond that? And these ideas have been applied to LIGO, the, the Laser Interferometric Gravity Observatory. And last year, Carl came to Colorado and visited us and gave a talk. And so he's, he's a guy who started that field on using, for example, squeeze light to improve the enhancement or improve the sensitivity of an interferometer 
And Carl pointed out that, well, if you look at the story of LIGO, at least $1 billion has been invested. And again, they, they would get to these points and they would say, well, let's buy a bigger laser because we can increase the signal a little bit and we can improve the sensitivity. And it's, it's after, he said, don't call the quantum optics guy to save you until you spend a billion dollars, okay? Or, or until you've exhausted your classical means. And I think, you know, I think he said that in kind of a, a fun, in jest. He, he, of course, has explored these ideas, introduced them, but I think it's, 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 a, it's kind of maybe just the practical point of the business is that, you know, doing the true quantum 2.0 things to improve metrology, maybe to improve computing, you know, these are really hard things, and it's going to take some time to really make them practical, I think. So, in the meantime, let's keep pushing on the things that we can do, but, but these are super exciting times, I think, and, and quite boundless, I would say, and I'm certain we're going to be surprised uh, with what we find. So, thank you, yeah, very, very nice reflections. So, we have a few questions here that uh, like to bring to, the, to you, and uh, some of those are in Spanish, so I will try to translate to, to English. Uh, so if you allow me, I will uh, read the first question. Uh, it says, what are the best uh, uh, research lines uh, uh, towards the uh, development of quantum computation? and what we can wait or expect for, uh, for that research in the short term. Is it clear? Or? So who, who do you want to, who do you want to respond? I don't know the answer to that, but I, I will say one thing that, um, that, like I said, I'm a semi-classical guy, okay? So I can talk a little bit from the outside. But I heard a nice talk by Chris Monroe, who's a colleague of Bill and, and Luis's in, in Maryland. And Chris started a company, it's, I think it's called IonQ. And he gave a talk at the Optical Society of America's um, Conference on Laser and Electro-Optics. And Chris said that the single biggest problems they have are problems that they need to solve with optics. And so I think that, that I guess maybe what I would answer that question is, it might surprise you that, that you know, the, the pure quantum 2.0 thing might not be the most important thing in building the next quantum computer. It might be that it's the technologies that are around that, that precious little quantum processing core that have to be improved or created to even make that work. So I would say it's quite broad, you know, in the case of, Chris's company, he was looking for people who knew optics, not people who knew how to cool and track ions. So, optics of course involved. So just to uh, uh, resonate with uh, this last comment, uh, uh, many of you may have wondered why your computer's speed is not increasing in the last 10 years. If you look at the speed of the classical computer, your laptop, your cell phone, it hasn't changed. And it is a very, very, very fundamental problem of heat dissipation in the electronics. The companies like Intel are not terribly interested in making the, uh, but they are interested in making, putting more and more and more uh, elements but what they are really worried about is in the dissipation of the heat. After all, making a, calcul a calculation, making a computation, costs you a certain amount of KT, right? And that needs to be dissipated. So yes, indeed, I think uh, this just points to what uh, we heard, that the, the optics is one of the things. I would say that in looking from outside, uh, there are also some very interesting questions about uh, uh, what is the architecture of a quantum computing? What, is, what are the uh, problems in a quantum computer? What are the 
the algorithms that has been said, but we don't know if they are really the best. But, uh, but th there is a lot of things to do on that side of the software uh, part of the uh, quantum computation. I'm not saying that the quantum computer is already built, but I do envision with a little bit of uh, optimism, actually not a general quantum computer, meaning like we have in our laptops, but special systems. That may be quite earlier. Uh, to a certain extent, you can say that a lot of the uh, quantum simulations that are going on are indeed in, uh, forms of less restrictive uh, in terms of the parameter space, but that, that we are already seeing and we are learning from them. But So to return to the original question about what should you do, what, what, what should you go into if you want to uh, have the, uh, uh, the best environment for, for quantum computation, well, my, my general view is that you should do the things that excite you, rather than trying to uh, imagine what's uh, uh, going to be the most successful thing. Look at what really uh, 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 inspires you. To, uh, uh, to work all night, because I absolutely agree, you have to work all night to get the good results. You know, one of the things you, you mentioned, uh, Eckhart, was um, uh, things that were really hard before become easy now. And that allows you to do the next thing that's hard. Because the thing that took you until after midnight to do the year before, now you do it by noon, and it means you do something new by midnight. But it always happens after midnight, right? <laughs> Uh, and and you should work on the things that that are going to keep you so excited that you want to stay there in the lab all night to uh, uh, to get it done. Um, today we have uh, uh, a number of choices of things that look really good. Ions are uh, arguably the most advanced platform uh, for doing quantum computation. But people wonder, will you able be able to scale this up to? Uh, the kind of uh, machine that could, could factor big numbers. Uh, superconducting qubits have been improving really rapidly, but they're still a long way away from, from uh, uh, having the, the, the kind of fidelity that, that you have with, uh, with ions. Uh, uh, Ultra-cold atoms uh, have the same kind of intrinsic capabilities that ions have, but they really haven't been developed in the same way. There's an awful lot of room for for develop, uh, development there. Um, one of the things that, that Luis pointed out that's very important is that quantum computation may not be the ultimate goal. That is, running Shor's algorithm. Maybe the, the ultimate goal is doing quantum simulations or doing sort of short quantum computations that you still couldn't do on a, on a classical computer, but not uh, something that requires full-blown error correction so you could solve uh, quantum problems that are interesting. Uh, and they could either be done by quantum simulation uh, or by doing simple digital computations that don't, don't require full-blown full error correction. Uh, and, and these may be among the most important things that come out of quantum computation, not, not factoring numbers, uh, but uh, just understanding materials better by being able to, uh, to solve simple Hamiltonians that are difficult to solve numerically on, on classical machines. But my feeling is that there's just so many interesting things out there. Uh, just, just pick whatever turns you on. <laughs> okay, I have here more questions related with quantum computing and quantum supremacy. But I will just select one more about uh, ready with quantum computing. Uh, it says, um, in relation with the recent announcement about uh, the uh, quantum supremacy of Google. So what we can <coughs> expect for about the uh, security uh, in in about security and information on networks uh, in the in the short term 
or medium term. So, yeah. Okay, well, those are really two very different questions. The, the, the question of the, the announcement of quantum supremacy by Google, which was almost immediately withdrawn, remember? So, oh, has the paper appeared? No, I didn't see that. Oh, I, I well, today's Thursday, so I haven't, uh, okay. Uh, well, then, um, uh, I won't say anything about that, and I'll leave it to somebody who's read the paper. Uh, uh, but my understanding is that, that, that if it, that while it may have shown quantum supremacy, it's not for a problem that anybody actually cares about. But, uh, but that doesn't mean it's not interesting or important. But when it comes to, in the short term, uh, security, it's going to be, it's all going to be classical. We're not going to have, in the short term, if by the short term you mean the next few years, we're not going to have widespread use of, uh, of, uh, of quantum communication or quantum key distribution. Uh, I think that, that uh, you know, key distribution can be done in classical ways that's extremely uh, secure. Sending an agent with a briefcase uh, handcuffed to their, their wrist uh, uh, is a time-honored way of, uh, of producing a secure key, and it's still going to be a time-honored way. And uh, uh, people still can't break uh, uh, encryption keys that have enough digits because we don't have quantum computers. So uh, I don't think we're going to see a quantum uh, uh, incursion into uh, computer security and, and, uh, and communication security, but that may come. And uh, as, as Scott pointed out, if we want to be ready for it when we need it, we better be working on it now. Uh, this, that truth has been demonstrated again and again and again that you'd better be ready when you need it because you don't know what's coming. And so that's why we do this kind of work, or one of the reasons why we do this kind of work. I mean, let's face it, the real reason we do this work is because it's so much fun. But the reason we give to our funding agents for why we do the work is that we better understand these things because we don't know when we might need it. And it turns out that that argument is true. And we've seen the truth of it again and again and again. But who knows something about the article that was published? I read it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's exactly like you said. It's an algorithm that produces nothing useful at all. It's, it's a very specific calculation that could show that they could do something in minutes that would take a normal computer 10,000 years. So I, I think they're, right, it's Google, it's, it's companies. I think this is actually quite an interesting thing because it's been a long time, at least in, in the US, where, you know, since Bell Labs kind of folded, or at least their big research efforts slowed down in the late 90s, that now we have a company at the forefront once again telling us what, or, or showing us maybe some way in the future, like, much as Bell Labs did by producing the transistor and the laser, and you know, observing the, the microwave background for the first time. So there, there are, it's, I think that's kind of an interesting aspect of this, so there's probably gonna be a little bit of hype, I would say, because okay, companies have to show that they're doing something cool and people will keep investing in them. So, um, but anyway, I, I, I after reading the article, I, I mean, it's and under, the very little that I understand about it is that no, it wasn't anything that's useful, and it's still going to be decades before there can be a quantum computer that can solve a problem that is something that we could actually make use of, a simulation or or factoring a big number. So, so I think that it's the immediate ramification is is still not there. I would say. A little bit of, of excitement, though. As, as far as what kind of thing you could do that would really be exciting, something that I think that is within our grasp, although it's still uh, far away, is what I would call an immortal qubit. Uh, the way that you fight decoherence in quantum computation is by error correction. People have demonstrated error correction and have been able to extend the, uh, the lifetime of a qubit by a little bit. I'm not sure what the record is, but it's of the order of a factor of two, I think. So what I'd really like to see is to have someone running error correction on just one qubit, 
And obviously that's not going to be enough to do anything that anybody cares about. But if you could do error correction on a single logical qubit, and that's probably going to involve a thousand or more physical qubits, but if you could do error correction on a single qubit uh, and extend the lifetime of that qubit for a really significant time, the time that it might take to do an interesting computation, that's going to be a milestone in quantum computation that's going to make everybody really pay attention. And it seems to me it's something that without which you will never make a general purpose quantum computer. So I'd love to see an immortal qubit sometime before I die. I would just add one other thing is that there's, you know, maybe some of you also saw that commentary is that, you know, when, when Sputnik went up, all it did was go around the Earth and beep, right? So, so maybe the first quantum computer that's been demonstrated, it doesn't do really anything at all. But it inspires a new generation, and, it's, and, it, and it motivated an entire new generation to work on problems that were really hard, and people solved them. And so I think perhaps that's, that's the best thing that, that paper and nature could do for us. So now, uh, let's go to us. The audience and bring questions. No more. I will not take more questions from the notebook, but now from you. Do you want to have to formulate a question right now? So there. Yeah. So this is something that I wanted to ask you, Bill, since uh, the end of your talk. Uh, but now it fits really well to this uh, discussion. And it, it extends not only to the, the international system of units, but also to technologies. When the first transistors and, and the lasers were invented, like, the general public never thought about uh, all the impact that the, these technologies now have in the everyday life of, of the people. With uh, the 2.0 quantum technologies nowadays, you that are in the midst of, the, of, the, of, of these developments, what do you think that is going to be the real impact of these technologies? Or, or, or which uh, uh, particular developments you, you think that are going to be the, the, the strongest ones for, for the general public uh, everyday life? Like, for example, the, the synthesis of new uh, 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 pharmaceutical products or things like that. What do you think that is going to be the strongest uh, uh, change in the everyday life of people? Well, I think the only honest answer would be, I have no idea. Uh, almost every attempt by people like physicists, or really anyone, to predict what technology is going to be like in the future have failed miserably. I remember when I was a boy, by now we were all supposed to have our own rocket ships that were going to take us everywhere we wanted to go, and nobody talked about computers. When you think about how our lives have been changed by computers, I can remember uh, when uh, uh, the heads of big computer companies said there is no reason why anyone would want to have a computer in their home. And now we all have hundreds of computers in our homes. Uh, so I think that, that everybody who tries to predict these things always gets it wrong. I think it's fairly safe to say that for the foreseeable future, by which I mean a few decades, that we won't see the second quantum revolution having the kind of impact that the first quantum revolution did. Uh, but as to what kind of impact it will ultimately have, you know, maybe you're right, maybe it'll be in, in drug design. Uh, that, that quantum pharmacology will be the, the thing that really changes our lives. Uh, you know, atomic clocks changed our lives, but th they were pretty poor atomic clocks that did it. Uh, you know, I mean, it's not the kind of atomic clocks that these guys are, are making. It was the kind of atomic clocks that were as good as atomic clocks were in the laboratory a pretty long time ago are what's up, up in, in uh, orbit for, for GPS, and that changed our lives in a, in a fundamental way. So, uh, boy, uh, it's just so hard to, uh, to guess, and, and I know anything I said would be wrong. Um, 
And, uh, but I'd love to hear what, uh, what other people think. But remember, no, I guess I've never said it in front of this audience, but uh, my favorite um, uh, US philosopher is Yogi Berra. Uh, now Yogi Berra was a catcher for the New York Yankees, uh, but he's also a philosopher. And uh, what he said was, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. Okay, so one more. So one of you want to make more comments? Okay. I would just just to uh, resonate with Bill on this uh, the, the the difficulties of the second quantum revolution. I, I see uh, lingering over all our advances uh, dissipation. That that's really the thing that we need to tame. The, the thing that we need to. So the, the thing that Bill was dreaming is exactly a taming way of dissipation. But if it's going to cost you to have a thousand qubits to keep one, uh, that, that's a very large price that you're paying. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there are no other ways to uh, tame dissipation. Maybe we just need to, uh, to think better both theoretically and experimentally. Uh, but, it, it, yeah, most of the, I see most of the enemies uh, that we have really for advances end up being dissipation channels. And there's been enormous advances, as Bill pointed out, in, in uh, the dissipation of, uh, uh, in solid in, in state materials, but, uh, it's not enough. It's just not enough. And it's, there are some very profound questions of what is it and what's causing it, and there are some very uh, good questions uh, in, in terms of how do I do the classical part better? So things like, okay, I am illuminating the sample, but there is curvature in the wavefront. How to char characterize exactly that curvature of the wavefront? Because now uh, that's going to imprint a different phase depending on where you are in that wavefront. That's optics, the, 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 and that causes can be the cause of uh, uh, defacing on your system. So. The advances in quantum technology in many, many areas, particularly, I, I think, again, on the uh, superconducting side, have mostly been developed by, or enabled by making the coherence longer, the, making sure that you have a coherent, that the superposition, that the entanglement survive longer. And, and you have, and we have to learn, and we saw some talks already, how difficult it is to measure the dynamics of a system entangled with three qubits. Forget about uh, n, when n goes to infinity, but already for three events. So those are, but then if on top of that you add dissipation, that's, we don't know. But at the same time, I don't want to leave this in such a pessimistic mood. And it seems to me that we ought to dream. So, so if you're dreaming, then you might dream about quantum pharmacology giving you new kinds of drugs that could treat uh, things. But you can also imagine that a better understanding of materials would improve the efficiency of light harvesting. And you might have uh, ways of harvesting solar energy that could have a big impact on our whole global warming uh, problem, the whole energy. Uh, issues, you uh, might uh, solve uh, the problem of high temperature superconductivity. And if you understood what the real mechanism was behind high temperature superconductivity, maybe that would allow you to design materials that would be better high temperature superconductors that could allow you to uh, uh, operate at room temperature with zero dissipation and think what that would do. So I think there's all sorts of amazing dreams you could have that maybe uh, uh, quantum simulation and, and 
uh, and quantum computation would, would give you. But I'm almost sure that anything we guess now is not going to be the right thing. But I'm also pretty confident that the things we're not guessing are going to be even more wonderful. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think it doesn't hurt to dream, you know, because uh, some of the things that we couldn't even imagine when I was a kid, if somebody told me that you'd hold a little piece of equipment in, in your hand and you could just use it to call anyone anywhere in the world, I'd have said, oh, go to hell, that's science fiction, it doesn't happen. <laughs> or if somebody said... with video. And, and with video. And, and again, if somebody said you'd, you'd hold a piece of equipment and it'll tell you where on earth you are with a precision of a few centimeters or a meter. I mean, all that was science fiction. In, in a similar fashion, when I was a kid watching uh, the serial on television called Star Trek, there was, there was uh, one phenomenon which used to really fascinate me. You know, that's teleporting an individual from one place to another. You remember that? <laughs> Mr. Spock. Beam me up, Scotty. Uh, beam, beam me up, Scotty. Yeah, so teleportation, it's kind of, at that time, it seemed so unreal. But then it's happening at the atomic level. Who knows? I mean, it'll perhaps not happen in my lifetime, but who knows, uh, years into the future, we could perhaps be teleporting ourselves to a different place. I don't know, it doesn't hurt to dream. No, it certainly doesn't hurt to dream, but let me just say something about teleportation. Um, a, uh, a colleague of ours, a guy named Lawrence Krauss, you might have read some of his uh, stuff, wrote a popular book called The Physics of Star Trek, in which he tried to imagine how you could actually do some of the things that were done in Star Trek, and he refused to touch teleportation basically because he said even I mean and, and people had done teleportation of a, a single photon and he said the idea of extending that to teleporting a human being is was so far beyond that he wasn't even going to touch it in this sort of fanciful uh, uh, examination but who knows that's the thing who knows Today, what we cannot even dream will perhaps become reality a uh, hundred years from now. No. So I, I would like to uh, sort of draw to a historical lesson from the first quantum revolution. Uh, I think all of you know that the transistor was invented in 48, but the real use, the real use didn't start until 10 or 12 years later. And that is not what happened into the laser. The laser have uh, the development uh, going into the field was much, much closer. Why is that? I don't know. But, and who has changed our lives far more? Come on, the transistor. By, by a lot. As I keep saying uh, when I give a talk about that, is like, remember, you should, when you are declaring your love to your beloved, you should not say, I love you more than the uh, grains of sand in the world. You should say, I love you more than the transistors that we have made. <laughs> That's not going to be very popular, but, it's, it's, but it is true. I need to write that. <laughs> to tell my wife. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think it's time to close the session. Um, I want to ask you to join us in applause to all of the speakers. Thank you very much. Have a great night. See you tomorrow morning. So thank you very much.